COVID-19 pandemic has really increased the prevalence of anxiety worldwide. So before I go on to talking about cognitive therapies, I just want to mention that this, this piece of, of anxiety, this uncertainty ha is pretty unprecedented with regard to a pandemic. Nobody in, you know, who's alive today has really gone through a, a pandemic. The last big one was you know, the, the flu in uh, over 100 years ago. And so there was a huge amount of uncertainty that came both with the um, how dangerous or transmissible and all of these uncertainties related to the uh, COVID-19 when it first came on. I don't know if any of you remember uh, you know, not even knowing how long it could survive on surfaces. So in the United States, we were leaving our packages outside for days because we weren't sure if, if it could still be alive on a package that was delivered through uh, a postal service. On top of that anxiety, there was economic anxiety, there was anxiety around school, there's anxiety around working from home, just a huge amount of uncertainty that was that was really increasing the prevalence of anxiety. So back to what I was talking about with regard to, you know, cognitive treatments, you know, it would be great if we could just tell our brains to stop worrying. Uh, the problem is, as uh, attributed to Einstein, you know, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And the reason I bring this quote forward is that it's really hard to think our way out of a problem. And so some of the cognitive therapies that really rely on us being able to, you know, uh, do these cognitive techniques, they require the, or it's associated with the prefrontal cortex. So, so cognitive control, for example, has been uh, localized or shown to be um, involved or, uh, or uh, the prefrontal cortex is shown to be involved in, in cognitive control. The problem here is that the prefrontal cortex is the youngest and it's the weakest part of the brain when it comes from an evolutionary perspective. So when you think about this evolutionarily speaking, this is the, the newest kid on the block. And the problem here is that it's the first part of the brain that goes offline when we get stressed or when we get anxious. And so some people can activate their cognitive control in moments when they're really anxious, but a lot of us can't. I would say the majority of us, it's really, really challenging. So what I'd like to talk about today is, you know, how can we um, really start to understand how our brains work and can we actually leverage that understanding as a way to work with anxiety in a different way. So I'm going to show you a very short animation that kind of gives you the most concise neuroscience primer that I could put together around all that we know uh, about anxiety and how it is formed. And what I'll say before I show you this is that this was probably one of, if not the most uh, astounding um, thing that I learned uh, after I'd never learned this in medical school or residency. And I had to, I, you know, as I was struggling as a psychiatrist trying to help my own patients, I went back to the literature to figure out how I could help. And it turns out that anxiety can actually be driven like a habit. So I'll show you how that can be the case. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we might be able to work with it. Anxiety Gone Viral, Why Fear and Uncertainty Spread Anxiety Through Social Contagion and How to Protect Yourself. Anxiety is a strange beast. As a psychiatrist, I've learned that anxiety and its close cousin panic are both born from fear. As a behavioral neuroscientist, I know that fear's main evolutionary function is helping us survive. In fact, fear is the oldest survival mechanism we've got. Fear helps us learn to avoid dangerous situations in the future through a process called negative reinforcement. For example, if we step out into a busy street, turn our head and see a car coming right at us, we instinctively jump back onto the safety of the sidewalk. Evolution made this really simple for us. So simple that we only need three elements in situations like this to learn. 
an environmental cue, a behavior, and a result. In this case, walking up to a busy street cues us to look both ways before crossing. The result of not getting killed helps us remember to repeat the action again in the future. Sometime in the last million years, humans evolved a new layer on top of our more primitive survival brain, called the prefrontal cortex. Involved in creativity and planning, the prefrontal cortex helps us think and plan for the future. It predicts what will happen in the future based on past experience. If we don't have enough information, our prefrontal cortex lays out different scenarios about what might happen next, and guesses which will be most likely. It does this by running simulations based on previous events that are most similar. Enter anxiety. Anxiety is defined as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Anxiety comes up when our prefrontal cortices don't have enough information to accurately predict the future. We saw this with the novel coronavirus that was discovered in China at the end of 2019, COVID-19. Scientists race to study the characteristics of any new virus so that we can know precisely how contagious and deadly it is and act accordingly. Uncertainty abounds. Without accurate information, it is easy for our brains to spin stories of fear and dread. In addition to being fueled by uncertainty, anxiety is also contagious. In psychology, the spread of emotion from one person to another is termed social contagion. Our own anxiety can be cued or triggered simply by talking to someone else who is anxious. Their fearful words are like a sneeze landing directly on our brain, emotionally infecting our prefrontal cortex and sending it out of control as it worries about everything from whether our family members will get sick to how our jobs will be affected. Wall Street is a great example of social contagion. We watch the stock market spike and crash, the stock indices being a thermometer for how feverish our collective anxiety is at any one moment. Wall Street even has something known as the Fear Index, which with coronavirus outstripped the financial meltdown of 2008. When we can't control our anxiety, that emotional fever spikes into panic. Panic is defined as sudden, uncontrollable fear or anxiety, often causing wildly unthinking behavior. Overwhelmed by uncertainty and fear of the future, the rational thinking parts of our brains go offline when we're panicked. Logically, we know that we don't need a six-month supply of toilet paper, but when we see someone else's cart piled high, their anxiety infects us, and we go into survival mode. So how do we not panic? Too many times I've seen my anxious clinic patients try to suppress or think themselves out of anxiety. Unfortunately, both willpower and reasoning rely on the prefrontal cortex, which isn't available at these critical moments. Instead, I start by teaching them how their brain works, so that they can see how uncertainty weakens the brain's ability to deal with stress, priming it for anxiety when fear hits. So now that you know how your brain works, it really comes back to just remembering these three things. And in fact, this process, this reward-based learning process is set up for memory formation. It goes back to these positive and negative reinforcement loops that start with hunger, you know, so we can remember where food is. And they also uh, are to completely applicable with uh, avoiding danger, you know, so we can remember where danger is and avoid it in the future. Now, the thing that I hadn't learned in medical school and that has probably helped me uh, be able to change my clinical practice around helping my patients with anxiety is that anxiety can actually be driven like a habit. Now, it turns out that there's a fair amount of work going back to the 1980s, starting with Thomas Borkovec and others, uh, where they suggested that anxiety could actually be driven through a negatively reinforced process. Now, ironically, in the 1980s was the time when a lot of people were being prescribed benzodiazepines for anxiety. These are no longer prescribed as first-line treatments for anxiety for a number of reasons. 
And also it was when the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor was, uh, was put into the market, uh, Prozac or, or fluoxetine. I think that was approved in 1985 uh, by the FDA in the US. So there was a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on medication treatments. And you know, I, I don't know historically what happened, but there was really not a lot of emphasis on this type of thing. Now, if you look at this, so the feeling of anxiety itself can feel pretty unpleasant. Uh, we can also have an unpleasant thought can lead us to worrying. And what's been suggested is that the, the reward comes from either avoiding the worst feeling, feeling of anxiety, because worry doesn't feel as bad as anxiety itself, and or where we might feel in control. You know, we might not really have much control, but that feeling of control is better than doing nothing. The problem is that the more uh, we worry, the less rewarding it actually is to the point where we find out that worry can actually feed back and drive anxiety itself. You know, I love this quote from Alan Watts, who is a philosopher uh, who I think died in the 1970s. He talks about ego, the self which he believes himself to be, is nothing but a pattern of habits. And I bring this forward because it was, it's been really interesting to contemplate this around, you know, who we believe ourselves to be and where that identification or that identity comes from. And what I think he might be getting at is that we can become identified with our thoughts and we can become identified with our behaviors. So for example, I had a, a pilot tester of our unwinding anxiety program who wrote me an email and said, what I'm struggling with is the kind of anxiety that comes from who I perceive myself to be and the seemingly impermeable blanket of not good enoughness that it is wrapped in deep etched in the bones anxiety. Now, this really struck me where somebody could be just so identified with a thought or an emotion where they feel like, you know, as she described, is deeply etched in my bones. So if we bring this back to the Alan Watts quote and simply replace ego with the word anxiety, it makes a lot of sense. Anxiety, the self, which he has believed himself to be is nothing but a pattern of habits. And what that suggests is if this is a pattern of habits, we can formulate a hypothesis that we can test. If we can learn to be uh, somebody who worries a lot, for example, who is somebody who is so identified with their anxiety that they can't imagine themselves any other way, it suggests that they can also unlearn this. So the first step is we've got to be aware of being caught up in a habit loop. If we're not aware, we're just going to be lost. We think of this as um, you know, being on autopilot, as, as I'm sure many folks are familiar with. The second step is exploring the results of the behavior. And this might sound a little strange at first, but we'll talk about some of the neuroscience behind how this works. And I have people, my patients in my clinic, just ask the simple question, what do I get from this? Third step, is to help step out of the loop. It could be simply not doing whatever it is, like not worrying, not overeating. Or it could also be a mindfulness practice that helps somebody step out of the loop. 